invited comments to how best to oversee certain derivatives. Ms. Warren was concerned that unfettered, opaque trading could threaten our regular, could quote, threaten our regulated markets or indeed our economy without any federal agency knowing about it, unquote. She said in congressional testimony, she called for greater disclosure of trades and reserves to cushion against losses. Ms. Barnes views and cited fierce opposition from Mr. Greenspan and Robert E. Rubin, the Treasury Secretary then. Treasury lawyers concluded that merely discussing the rules threatened the derivatives market. Mr. Greenspan warned that too many rules would damage Wall Street, prompting the traders to take their business overseas. Greenspan told Brooksley that she essentially didn't know what she was doing and, and she caused a financial crisis. And Michael Greenberger, who was senior director of the commission, uh, said that Brooksley was this woman who was not playing tennis with these guys and not having lots of work with these guys. And there was a little bit of a feeling that this woman was just not at Wall Street. In, in early 1998, Rubin's deputy, uh, Rubin's deputy, Larry H. Lawrence H. Summers, called Ms. Bourne and chastised her for taking steps he said would lead to a financial crisis, according to Mr. Greenberg. Summers said he could not recall the conversation, but agreed with Mr. Greenspan and Mrs. Mr. Rubin that Ms. Bourne's proposal was highly problematic. On April 21, 1998, senior financial regulators convened in a wood panel conference room to discuss Ms. Bourne's proposals. Mr. Rubin and Mr. Greenspan implored her to reconsider. Ms. Bourne pushed ahead on June 5, 1998. Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Rubin, and Mr. Levin called on Congress to prevent Ms. Bourne from acting until the more senior regulators developed their own recommendations. Mr. Levin says he now regrets that decision. Mr. Greenspan and Mr. Rubin were joined at the hip of this, he said. And they were certainly very fiercely opposed to this, per se, that this would cause chaos. Ms. Bourne soon gave a potent, potent example in the fall of 1998, when the hedge fund long-term capital nearly collapsed, dragged down by disaster bets on derivatives. More than a dozen banks pulled $3.6 billion in private rescue money to prevent the fund from slipping into bankruptcy and endangering other firms. Despite the event, Congress pulled the Gross Commodity Future Trading Commission's regulatory authority for six months. The following year, Ms. Bourne departed. As the stock market worked forward on the heels of historic bull market, the dominant view was that good times largely stemmed from Mr. Greenspan's legacy, Mr. Greenspan's steady hand to bed. Um, to, in 2000, uh, Tom Harkin, you know, the senator from Iowa, asked what might happen if Congress weakened the Commodity Futures Trading Authority. If you have this exclusion that something unforeseen happens, who, who, who does something about it? He asked Mr. Greenspan in the hearing. Mr. Greenspan said that Wall Street could be trusted. There's a very fundamental trade-off for what kind of economy, what, what kind of type of economy you wish to add, he said. You can add huge amounts of regulation, and I will guarantee nothing will go wrong, but nothing will go right uh, either. Later that year, at a congressional hearing on the merger boom, he argued that Wall Street had tamed risk. Are you concerned with uh, such a growing concentration of wealth that if one of these huge institutions fails, it will have a horrendous impact on the nation and the economy, as Representative Barry Sanders, an independent from Vermont. No, I am not, Mr. Greenspan replied. I believe that general growth in large institutions have occurred in the context of an underlying structure of markets in which many of the large banks are dramatically, I should say, fully hedged. The House overwhelmingly passed the bill that kept the derivatives in clear uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission oversight. Senator Graham attached the rider limiting Commodity Future Trade Commission's authority to an 11,000 page, 11,000 page appropriation bill. The Senate passed it, President Clinton signed it into law. So there we go. We have these derivatives. I, I can do this. So how big is the derivative problem? Okay, according to the World Bank, the world GDP is 60 trillion. The US GDP is 14 trillion. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of scale. Ignore the trillion, just go 60 to 14 point. Now according to the Bank of International Settlement, as of uh, the end of 2008, there were 591 trillion dollars of derivatives flowing. That's nine times world GDP. In 
and the value of these privileges that they trade back and forth is 33.89 billion. So that's 50% of GDP. If these were to blow up, where's the money going to come from? This is just nuts. Now, for years, I've been watching these reports coming from the OCC. This is the Office of Control of Currency, and they have this quarter before report on derivatives. And I'm looking at this thing, you know, like uh, last spring, and here, this is, so here we are at, at $170 trillion of derivatives in our $14 trillion economy. These are all side bets that are traded over the counter with no oversight, that are being done by their banks that are backed by the FDIC. I'm looking at this going, this is crazy. We're, we're going to have banks go down. Okay, so here we have the top five banks have almost all the derivatives. The green is, is all the other banks. And the, and the, the light green is the top five banks. All the derivatives are in the banks. Now, here's, here's from the first quarter of 2009. No, it was about $170 trillion. Now it's grown to $200 trillion. And our economy is down to about $13.8 trillion. So these are all bets that we don't understand that are backed by us. And that's why, it's a, that's why as Chris Whalen said, it's an empty, empty bucket. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go through these a little bit fast. Again, here is all of your, um, this is a chart showing how much uh, derivatives exposure they have compared to their capital, it's 500%. Uh, Goldman Sachs was allowed to uh, become a bank and, and their derivatives is 10 times their capital. So I know this has been probably dull and, and, and dry and, and, and rather arcane, but it was very difficult for me. Everywhere I look in the financial system, these the naked sharding of stocks and bonds, dark liquidity pools, high frequency trading, which was just banned by the way yesterday where the banks would front run all of our, our trading and make a nickel a share. They were getting, they had their computers on the, on the exchanges and they were getting information on the trading of the public and they'd get in in front and they'd get, get a nickel a share on all of us. It, it, front running is illegal and, and it was institutionalized and our biggest institutions were doing to it. So it would all become, in, um, what, we've, what, what has occurred here was foreseeable it was done with the cooperation of large institutions and the government. It's been a complete failure, and now we're stuck. And now we're going to have to turn to what our next speakers, you know, for hope, our next speakers are going to bring us. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, this is pretty, pretty sad. So anyway, I'm out of time. Yeah, any questions? buy something, who we buy it from, all of that. We need to be concerned with justice in every decision we make. Do we go to the small, do we go to the small restaurant, do we go to McDonald's, okay? Um, 